You're listening to the Slavic Literature Pod, your shelf help guide to all things Slavic. I'm Matt Garasimovich, PhD candidate at Northwestern University studying Russian literature and film. And I'm Cameron Lalana, a literature enthusiast and guy working in media. This is the podcast for people who want to learn more about Slavic literature, art, and culture. Every episode, we're going to be bringing you the background and analysis you'll need to know and understand these works. If you're interested in supporting us, you can head on over to our website, slaviclitpod.com. All right, Matt, what are we getting into this week? This week, we have uh, not exactly a Tolstoy fan favorite, but an interesting <laughs> one nonetheless. Uh, Tolstoy we're going to be covering un- unfan favorite? An unfan favorite, maybe, but it's still fun. Uh, we're going to be covering Leo Tolstoy's The Kreutzer Sonata, and we are so grateful not to have to tackle this one alone. Today, we're joined by Dr. Tatiana Gershkovich. Tatiana is the William S. Dietrich Associate Professor of Russian Studies at Carnegie Mellon University. She is the author of Art and Doubt, Tolstoy, Nabokov, and the Problem of Other Minds, published by Northwestern University Press in 2022. She's also published essays in the PMLA, the Slavic and Eastern European Journal, the Journal of the History of Ideas, the Paris Review, and more. Her scholarship has been recognized by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Academy in Berlin, and the International Vladimir Nabokov Society. She's also the co-editor of Tolstoy Studies Journal. Tatiana, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. Maybe um, I'm not exactly alone, but maybe I'm in the minority, but I love the Kreutzer Sonata. Uh, I think it's absolutely well, one of Tolstoy's best works. Um, <laughs> and believe it or not, it had some fans, uh, including among women of Tolstoy's time. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to get into it. Yeah. And this has been an episode like nine months in the making because we've been so slow at scheduling. Um, so I'm glad we were able to finally get this one going. <laughs> Yeah, so, well, as relatedly, you kind of broached this topic already, but the thing we kind of wanted to open with is, you know, why the Kreutzer Sonata? We've mentioned uh, it's not a fan favorite, and for people uh, out there who are who are not familiar with the Kreutzer Sonata, uh, we're basically what we're covering here is we've got the story of a man on a train uh, who has killed his wife and is explaining his rationale to a stranger for doing so. It's the worst bathroom line conversation you could ever get into. Uh, but <laughs> Tatiana, do you... Um, and thank you for coming on to talk with us about it, because I don't think we really felt prepared to do it alone. Uh, can you talk about like why it would be why it's one of you've mentioned that you're a big fan? You know, why cover it? Why, you know, take it seriously, which is something that a lot of people are OK with just kind of walking away being like, all right, we'll leave this one alone. Well, I think maybe one of the reasons that um, some readers might not respond to the courts or Sonata is it reads a little bit like a moral tract um, as Tolstoy expresses many ideas about sexuality, uh, about um, sort of the ideal of chastity in the story. Um, There are some sort of hilarious and suspect lines about um, what women should and shouldn't wear and so forth. But and so I think uh, what tends to get lost is that this is an artwork. In fact, it isn't a moral tract. And all of these opinions that Tolstoy, or not Tolstoy, but that his narrator really professes, we can't actually attribute to Tolstoy, and that the literary text is always pushing against them in various ways. So I think that's one of the things that appeals to me about the Kreutzer Sonata. And then I think under the surface of some of this moralizing and some of the sexual questions and uh, the sort of gender relation questions that have been more prominent in reader responses to the story. There's also a sort of deeper theme of egoism, a kind of abiding egoism that we're all susceptible to. Um, And just how easy it is for us to become inured to the outside world, trapped in our own ideas, in our own sort of projects, um, and unresponsive to other people, to sort of, to the point of forgetting that other people are autonomous uh, beings with um, ideas and objectives of their own. So I think I think that is a kind of lasting um, interest of the story. Mm-hmm. Cool. So I'm I'm interested because I feel like a lot of our fans, at least, are familiar with the Anna Karenina Tolstoy, the War and Peace Tolstoy, uh, a Tolstoy that maybe you can take a lesson from for you know your own life in what ways do you see the Kreutzer Sonata as sort of a continuation maybe of some of his earlier philosophy and in what ways do you see this kind of marking a departure do you see this sort of spiritual crisis Tolstoy um how do you what do you kind of make of it in his sort of chronology 
I think that many of the ideas that Tolstoy um, works out in the Kreutzer Sonata, so these ideas about egoism, about art, you know, the story is famous in part because um, it's often read as a sort of condemnation of art, that art is too exciting, <laughs> uh, that it's too stimulating and can can read to, lead to all sorts of um, bad outcomes. Uh, so some of his aesthetic ideas, some of his ideas about sexuality, egoism, and so forth, um, they are already present in Anna Karenina and in War and Peace. And in fact, he's sort of pretty consistent, I would say, in his concerns from the beginning of his career to the end. Um, but they become maybe more acute uh, and he becomes in some ways uh, less dialectical in the way that he presents them. Uh, so the stories, as I mentioned, you know, reads maybe more uh, as a moral tract than Anna Karenina does. When in fact, it, it, to me, it seems just as complicated on, on these various issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how you see that kind of uh, play out maybe in the structure of the story between the reliability of the narrators and things like this. I have heard uh, it, it put in this way that sort of Tolstoy is a bad reader of himself mm -hmm. and the effect that maybe he wants to achieve and how, whether we can even know what he wants to achieve um, is different maybe than people take away from it. So like you said, maybe there really isn't that much of a difference between what he's doing in Anna Karenina in the Kreutzer Sonata. Maybe it has to do with our own perception of of the work and I'm kind of wondering when we get to this, how do we start to work it out uh, with Poznashev and the sort of unreliability of the story that we're being told? Sure, yeah. Our narrator is sitting on the train and he starts to listen to these other conversations about the relationships between men and women and the way that society is changing. So the way that women are getting more of an education, uh, they're more sort of liberal uh, laws around divorce and so forth. And Poznashev uh, is listening to this conversation, but not participating in it. He's actively avoiding eye contact with people um, until uh, the conversation turns to uh, sort of the terrible things that can happen between men and women stuck in, in a bad marriage. And then he says, ah, so you heard about me. Um, so he's immediately marked as a kind of paranoid, right? Who said anything about you? Uh, somebody mentions a critical episode in a marriage and he thinks, oh, they're talking about me. So Tolstoy immediately establishes Poznashev as an unreliable narrator. More than that, Poznashev, if you sort of pay attention to the details of the story, the way that he uh, starts to um, narrate his life, uh, he starts the narration as the sun is setting, right? So it becomes dark in the train car. He has isolated his listener, our narrator, and he starts feeding him the strong tea that he's made. And if you know a little bit about Tolstoy, Tolstoy um, uh, was against alcohol, right? He, he was against people drinking alcohol, but he put tea, strong tea, kind of in a similar category of things that befuddle the senses like opium and alcohol and so forth. So Poznashev is very purposefully deranging our narrator's senses in order to tell his story. So he's quite unreliable uh, as a narrator. And all of these theories that he then professes um, have to be seen within that frame, right? So the theory um, uh, of chastity, uh, the way that he talks about young men being corrupted early on, uh, encouraged to uh, visit brothels and so forth for their health, uh, the way that women are oppressed by men and then in turn uh, oppress men, right, with their demands for luxury and so forth. All of these ideas that uh, Poznashev articulates have to be seen um, you know, through this lens of the unreliable narrator. Um, now we can talk later, if you'd like, about the afterward that Tolstoy writes to the Kreutzer Sonata, where he seems inexplicably to then endorse all these ideas that he has <laughs> earlier filtered through an unreliable narrator. So that's an, another sort of set of issues that we can get to. Absolutely, and that's a great setup for for just a moment. Before we get there, because that is something I would like to talk about, because that is very interesting. Why don't we talk about a little bit of the background? So what, what, where we're coming to this story from? Yeah, I was wondering if you might be able to take us through the sort of a publication history of this, because it wasn't just uh, an easy, great, a new piece by Tolstoy, everyone's going to read it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some censorship. Even in the U.S., I was surprised to learn that it was censored by the post office, the distribution of it, mm -hmm. uh, and the way it was marketed as, ooh, banned in Russia and the U.S., 
this has to be something that you read. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of, you know, when it was written, when it was ultimately published, how that process sort of went. Absolutely. Um, a scholar called Peter Mueller has published a, a book called Postlude to the Kreutzer Sonata, where he discusses some of these, some of this reception history at length. But just to give you a brief sense, the story starts to circulate through public readings. So in 1889, Tolstoy gives his niece uh, uh, penult the penultimate version of the story uh, in manuscript, and she takes it to St. Petersburg, where the story starts to circulate by way of public readings. So they invite um, uh, people, up to 40, 50 people, to a reading of the story. And it's very in demand. So people are anticipating this story. They know that something new is coming out, that Tolstoy has written something, they're anticipating it. And there are actually cues uh, to either partake of these public readings, right, participate in these public readings, or to get their hands on the manuscript um, uh, and read it, including Nikolai Strahov, who's a um, was a close friend of Tolstoy's and, of course, a famous sort of literary personality and writer, critic. Um, he couldn't get his hands on the story in the first week. He had wanted to listen to it and then to read it in order to respond to Tolstoy. But actually, there's such a long queue that he couldn't get his hands on it um, for a while. So that's how the story starts to circulate in Russia. And it's banned uh, for its explicit themes, for the attitudes that seem to be sort of expressed on, on love and marriage and so forth. Um, and actually, it's Sophia Tolstoy, right, Tolstoy's wife, who is instrumental in um, a lot in securing permission for its publication as part of Tolstoy's collected works. So she actually petitions the Tsar Alexander III. She petitions him personally to allow for the publication. Um, and the Tsar, you know. I don't know how accurate this is, but the, the thinking goes that uh, Sophia does this in part because the story is read as autobiographical. So that this is a story about the marriage of Sophia and, and uh, Count Leo Tolstoy. And that many people are very sympathetic in, to Sophia. You know, they feel for her. It's quite embarrassing and so forth. And that she petitions the Tsar because she wants to create some distance between her personal life and the story, suggesting that while well, she's working on her husband's behalf, this is not, you know, a story about her. This is a literary work. And the Tsar, in turn, uh, so the story goes, feels so sorry for her that he decides to kind of relent and allow for the publication. Um, the story is published or the novella is published abroad uh, in various places. But again, the reception is uneven. Uh, so everyone wants to get their hands on it and everyone wants to read it on the one hand. On the other hand, many people find it objectionable, obscene, including Tolstoy's American translator who refuses to translate it um, and then publishes an essay about why she refuses to translate it. Um, so that's just to give you some sense of it. Uh, it, it is eventually published um, in uh 1891 in the 13th volume of collected works. Um, and the Tsar is banking to some extent that this will be too expensive for most people and that the story won't circulate. But in fact, it's quite popular and circulates um, actively among sort of the literate and literary in Russia. Yeah, I sort of miss this time, right? When, when literature could be so outrageous that people would you know, have such strong opinions about it. It's it's good. And especially <laughs> that I, I, I found Theodore Roosevelt called Tolstoy a sexual moral pervert after reading this, which is, I thought was hilarious. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There are a lot of opinions voiced on Tolstoy's sexuality afterward, mm. um, including by Sophia Tolstoy, um, <laughs> who, yeah, who, of course, recognized sort of the hypocrisy of preaching chastity, uh, having fathered, <laughs> you know, 13 children. Yeah. yeah. Right. And speaking of having a lot of children, uh, I'm going to go through a brief summary of the story. Seamless transition. There. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try as as um, Matt has posited previously. It's important to uh, even for some things that seem a little ridiculous sometimes as a reader. It's important to take it seriously and try to think of it like build on what we're having here. And I think this is a kind of a similar point which you make in your um, article, which I 
thought I had up here. But uh, anyway, so I'm not going to get too much into the details of what Poznashev says on this train, uh, because then I would get bogged down and a little bit making fun of it, which is not the goal here. Um, although I might might stop on the doctor thing. So we have, as we mentioned previously, I've uh, got this character who's on this train. And, and like you mentioned, Tatiana, we people are kind of having this discussion around modern issues. And then eventually this kind of nervous guy comes over and it's like, oh, let me let me give my opinion. And he ends up arguing with uh, this um, this kind of uh, society lady and this lawyer who on the train before they all depart. And finally, Poznachev sits down with the with our narrator and says, let me tell you my story uh, and takes you know, takes him through his his whole life, essentially starting off as, like you mentioned, as a young man, kind of thinking of himself as a relatively, relatively, um, I, don't, I don't know if this is the, the, how well this translates, I was reading an older translation, uh, but like kind of pure, morally upright, despite, you know, eventually engaging with uh, drinking and, and gambling and uh, going to brothels as a relatively young man. And as he posits that that basically poisoned his later life, um, as it comes to, uh, attitudes he takes from those days and how his characters formed from that follows into his, his marriage uh which uh, even from the outset sounds not good as he mentions as he after he meets his wife they can't really have a conversation uh so no warning flags being raised here and eventually you know as they they get into it they get married the ways that immediately becomes a sort of um uh, back and forth it is always an argument they always want to have a third person around it's easier to have um to have that for just for any conversation. Uh, eventually, they start having children. Uh, this guy really, uh, I'm sure, does a lot for his relationship when he goes on at length about how much doctors are really interfering with the natural process of children living and dying like it used to be in the old days. <laughs> Uh, really, if he, uh, this is not a real person, so obviously he never tells his wife that, but it's a real mystery that doesn't improve your relationship if you tell your wife you don't care if your kids live or die. Uh, <laughs> and right, this eventually leads into the actual catalyst of the, of the murder of his wife, although he says the story that it's really, it didn't, people blame it on this kind of an action of jealousy of, you know, a slighted husband, but he says it wasn't that. It, I mean, that did cause it, but if it hadn't been for this, this case it would have been something else it always would have ended in this way and talks about this young uh, this young man who enters their life who plays music his wife uh, gets along quite well and through this relatively brief relationship um, this guy comes over to their house eventually our, our, our narrator pose not our narrator excuse me pose narrator in this sub story Poznashev, leaves and comes back from uh, after on a business trip and has suspicions returns and finds the two in a room although as you pointed out it's not really clear exactly what was going on there but in other ways it maybe doesn't matter because that leads him to first to attack them um, and eventually stab and, and kill his wife although she dies quite slowly and you have this final scene of her you know uh, uh, after he falls asleep wakes back up she's been taken to another room and kind of they have one final conversation where he asks for forgiveness finally as he says uh recognizing a humanity of you know that this was a you know a human you know a human being which he had not up to this point recognized in his wife uh she passes he's arrested he goes to prison and then we flash forward to you know uh to where we are currently where he kind of sits the two poison chef and the, the narrator sit quietly on the train in, in silence more or less and that's where we leave this story uh which i think we mentioned at the top is like i think matt matt and i talked about this before a lot of the uh novella not to be too glib but feels like you're in a like at a bar or at a college party and someone approaches and starts talking to you and you're like i don't want to be in this conversation but i can't leave this <laughs> <laughs> i can't leave this line <laughs> Although the narrator does encourage him at a certain point. Um, he says, would you like me to keep telling you the story? And he says, yes, if it's not too painful. Right. So it's um, he's both sort of um, terrified and fascinated. Um, yeah. I kind of read Tolstoy's own egoism into this, though, like the idea that somebody wants to hear you so badly just monologue uh, <laughs> on and on and on and on about like some like personal event that happened to you. Um, but that's just me personally. I, I feel like this is kind of how Tolstoy would be, but that's my own personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Can we start off, if you don't mind? Uh, so you wrote an article, Suspicion on Trial, Tolstoy's The Kreutzer Sonata, and Navkov's The Poznashev Address, uh, in which you kind of touch on a number of points, but the one that kind of um, stuck out to me, and this is, I think, maybe something that would help our listeners in terms of like talking about this work uh, is that you approach ways of I guess interpreting understanding or reading literature uh, approaching it kind of suspiciously for some people or you know as other people have come in with a critique 
of, of the suspicious reading or kind of this third way, which you've posited or started positing here. And do you mind just covering that briefly uh, to help people understand your kind of a viewpoint coming into this? Sure. Um, let's see. Well, I could talk about it kind of from the perspective of academic discipline. So um, right now, um, an important conversation that people are having in cultural studies is that we've all become very well trained in what's been termed suspicious reading or paranoid reading. There are sort of different names for it, but it's this idea that we can't ever um, take a text at face value, that it's always channeling uh ideologies, um, sort of perspectives that are hidden below the surface and that our task as readers is basically to unearth these things that we have to, you know, always read between the lines against the grain and so forth to partake of this suspicious reading. Um, and uh, I think Tolstoy and Nabokov recognize that this mode of reading, which we perceive as something that um, that is kind of like a sophisticated way of reading that we need to be trained into this sort of critical suspicious mode. They recognize that in fact, oftentimes it's easier for us to suspect a text than to trust it, uh, than to really kind of go along with an author and um, recognize uh, a perspective other than our own. Because when we approach the text suspiciously, we're in a sense retaining a frame of reference that we bring to it. Right. So we we bring our particular kind of interpretive frame, frame of reference. And Tolstoy and Nabokov, I suggest in this article, both see the dangers of that, that we can become so trapped in our own way of seeing things um, that we actually don't recognize the world. Right. That we don't respond to anything in front of us. Um, and so I see the Kreutzer Sonata uh, as a kind of parable of suspicious reading. Poznashev uh, is our suspicious reader. And we, in some ways, reiterate his suspicions and sort of read suspiciously with him. And in some ways, we read suspiciously against him. But what Tolstoy is doing in the story, I think, is um, making us exhausted <laughs> uh, with this suspicion, right? That we become, we become exhausted reading suspiciously in this way and recognize sort of the dangers of it um, that, yeah, that we can fail to recognize another person. Uh, and Nabokov, I think, picks up this sort of narrative strategy from Tolstoy. So what they both do is channel our suspicions, curate our suspicions, in order to then make us feel more trusting toward the author. So we suspect the narrator, but trust the author, right? We become exhausted by suspicion, and then as a result, want to trust the text itself more. And I see Nabokov as learning this strategy in part from Tolstoy because he read the story and even um, wrote a dramatic monologue uh, in the character of Poznashev. And Nabokov uh, elaborates on this technique, expands it, and I see it sort of flourish in his later works like Pale Fire. Uh, Tolstoy, on the other hand, I think this kind of curating of suspicion is not enough for him because he ultimately wants art to have a moral message beyond just drawing us out of ourselves. Uh, I think he thinks that an artwork does a good deal um, in terms of, you know, expanding our moral capacities simply by counteracting our egoism, but ultimately that is not enough for him. Uh, I think that's the effect of art that he describes in the Kreutzer Sonata but it's not enough for him. And he pursues other strategies. Whereas I think for Nabokov, the ethical um, sort of center of art has to do with this drawing us out of ourselves, uh, out of our sort of persistent egoism. So I feel like it might be helpful to talk about the Kreutzer Sonata, the actual Sonata, not the, you know, the work, uh, or rather the Sonata in the work. And I'm kind of curious how you see that function in the a series of events that take place for Poznashev and you know sort of what effect does this art have on him you know how does Tolstoy view good art versus bad art or you know art that's not really worthy of as you say in your article of uh you know this art that gets anonymized mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. through through his writing so I'm kind of curious how you see that yeah uh, work itself out in Kreutzer Sonata Right. Um, so Poznashev, uh, just to take, can I just take one step back uh, to the summary sure. that we were discussing? So Poznashev, you know, he's describing this critical episode, which is the murder of his wife. 
Uh, but where he begins to describe it um, is way back when he's a 16 year old boy uh, who goes to a brothel and there's this initial fall, right? A kind of fall from innocence and so forth uh, where he has um, uh, uh, a sexual encounter, right? In this brothel. So he starts way back and he offers different explanations for this critical episode, right? The murder of his wife. So he starts um, by uh, attributing what happened to these depraved customs of his social class, uh, drinking alcohol, frequenting brothels and so forth. Then he, he suggests that no, no, you know, probably it's not quite that. It's sort of the inherent vileness of sexual love. Um, the inherent violence, right, of these relations between men and women and the inequality uh, between them. And then he finally, his final explanation, in a sense, is the intoxicating effect of music. So he works through all of these explanations and ends up with music, right? Uh, he says that uh, music, this musician, Trukhashevsky, who comes into his house, um, reawakens sort of passion of his wife for music and in this way seduces her, that this is the reason. Um, and Poznishev compares the impressions produced by music to those produced by hypnosis and arguing that art has this terrible, uh, terrible power to seduce and also, you know, to compel uh, one to murder in his case. And because Tolstoy had his own sort of quite controversial views on art and music and um, and in many ways would later echo some of uh, Poznishev's concerns about the danger of art in his treatise, What is Art? The story is often, again, sort of read in a straightforward way with uh, the Kreutzer Sonata, this piece that Trukhashevsky and Poznishev's wife perform as stimulating the murder, as being sort of the reason for the murder. But in fact, when you read closely, uh, the effect that the performance, this performance of the Kreutzer Sonata has on Poznishev is actually a very, um, it's a beneficial effect. It's a salutary effect. So Poznishev is this arch egoist, but in this moment when he's listening to the Sonata, he recognizes, he gets a sort of four glimpse of the humanity of his wife that he ultimately recognizes after the murder and of, and of Tuchashevsky's um, humanity. And he recognizes this kind of um, fellowship of human beings, right? This community. And this is what Tolstoy in What is Art says that that's exactly what art does, what good art does, is it brings people together. And when people are feeling hostile toward one another, but they listen to a great piece of music, they immediately feel united. Um, so Poznishev does experience this. The problem is that that doesn't last, right? It's only this moment uh, and then when he is separated in time from the performance, uh, when there are sort of other things in play, including this letter from his wife, where she casually mentions Trukhashevsky, the musician, has stopped by. Again, his jealousy is reignited. But it's important that in the text, it's not when he recalls the performance, he doesn't recall the Kreutzer Sonata, but a different piece of music. He calls it an impassioned little piece, and he doesn't remember anything about it. It's a completely anonymous piece of work. And anonymity um, of the artist for Tolstoy is often a marker of bad art. Uh, so a good artwork draws attention to somebody other than yourself, right? So you think of the artist that created it. You're, um, as Poznishev at one point says, you're transported into the position of the artist. He glosses it as... Uh, kind of dangerous, this transportation. But in fact, you know, we see that it has a beneficial effect. Um, but when you don't remember anything about it, when it's an anonymous piece of art, that's a mar marker of bad art. And bad art, uh, instead of drawing Poznishev out, stimulates his own imagination along the lines that it is accustomed to, which is sort of jealousy, uh, sexual desire, and all of these sort of unseemly things that lead uh, ultimately to the murder. Um, so I think it's complicated the way that art is figured here. Uh, and we can't take Poznishev's condemnation of the Sonata itself at face value. I don't think that's right. Um, he's mistaken there, right? He doesn't recognize this effect uh, for what it is. Yeah, and actually, I mean, maybe, I don't know if you read out the text, but uh, maybe it would be worth reading that passage now. 
A terrible thing in that sonata, especially the presto, and a terrible thing is music in general. What is it? Why does it do what it does? They say that music stirs the soul. Stupidity. A lie. It acts. It acts frightfully. I speak for myself, but not in an ennobling way. It acts neither in an an ennobling nor a debasing way, but in an irritating way. How shall I say it? Music makes me forget my real situation. It transports me into a state which is not my own. Under the influence of music, I seem to feel what I do not feel, to understand what I do not understand, to have powers which I cannot have. Music seems to me to act like yawning or laughter. I have no desire to sleep, but I yawn when I see others yawn. With no reason to laugh, I laugh when I hear others laugh. And music transports me immediately into the condition of the soul in which he who wrote the music found himself at that time. I become confounded with his soul, and with him I pass from one condition to another. But why that? I know nothing about it. He who wrote Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata knew well why he found himself in a certain situation. That condition led him to certain actions, and for that reason to him had a meaning. But to me, none whatever. And that is why music provokes an excitement which it does not bring to a conclusion. For instance, a military march is played, the soldier passes to the sound of the march, and the music is finished. A dance is played, I have finished dancing, and the music is finished. A mass is sung, I receive the sacrament, and again, the music is finished. But any other music provokes an excitement. And this excitement is not accompanied by the thing that needs properly to be done, and that is why music is so dangerous and sometimes acts so frightfully. Great. Yeah. I mean, so people have decoded this passage in a lot of different ways, um, reading it as sort of Tolstoy's uh, ideas about music. But for me, I mean, what a great thing, right, for an egoist uh, to be transport to be transported to a position other than him- his own. Uh, to finally, you know, look at the world in a way that's different from what he's used to. And you can see Poznachev grabbing for these conventions, right? He wants the mass. He wants the military march um, because he can't uh, sort of deal with recognizing a singular other being, right? With recognizing purposes other than his own and so forth. Um, And it does, in fact, have an ennobling effect. The problem is that it doesn't last very long. I'm also curious about the process of like art creation because this passage and the sonata, it made me think of the scene that really like never makes it into any Anna Karenina adaptation, like film adaptation, uh, this honeymoon period where Anna and Vronsky are in Italy and they're the, these conversations with the artists there and, you know, kind of picking up art and the challenge of creating like an authentic art. And so I'm kind of wondering if you see this as an extension of previous, uh, like, you know, thoughts on art, probably? Uh, or is there any sort of like break uh, with that? I have to think more about the connection with Anna Karenina because it's complicated. There's um, an evident connection with what is art, um, which Tolstoy writes a decade later. And Tolstoy's ideas sort of, I'll try to be brief, in what is art are that um, art can kind of be measured in two ways. So art can be infectious or not infectious. So that's kind of the first uh, the prerequisite is art in order to be real art has to be infectious. Um, so in a sense, it, it bypasses reason. It acts like yawning or, or laughter passes from one person to the next. But once art is infectious, it can be good or bad, right? It can transmit good feelings as well as bad feelings. And this is sort of a major tension in Tolstoy's theory of art, um, that it's amoral in a sense, right? You know, it's infectious. It could be good with good feelings, with bad feelings. On the other hand, um, he re- so he recognizes psychologically that art is sort of amoral. On the other hand, he desperately wants art to be a kind of force for good. He sort of recognizes its power uh, to sway people, to affect them. But then how do you ensure that that power isn't channeled in all of these um, dangerous directions? Um, and I mean, I guess this is one connection with Anna, uh, with Anna Karenina is that Anna is, of course, an artist, right? She's an artist of her own image. People have sort of decoded her in that way. Um and her artistry is dangerous. Kitty, if you remember that scene where Kitty is looking at the way that Vronsky and Anna see each other at that first ball, and she understands immediately that she won't be getting a, an offer of marriage from Vronsky, right? That he's fallen in love with this other person. And um, the word enchanting is repeated over and over and over. It's like a bell tolling, enchanting, enchanting, Anna's enchanting. So she's sort of bewitching. She's this seductress. She's infectious, right? The way that art is infectious. Um, 
But that also makes art dangerous because it can uh, it bypasses reason, right? It can steer you into all of these um, um, bad directions. Hmm. Interesting. If I, I so this feel free to push back on me here, but I in partially I think this is tangential to the point you're making in your piece here, uh, in that in talking about art as like uh, how can it not only be ennobling but also how might we if if we uh, take Tolstoy seriously and say, okay, how can art be made to be moral or to convey a moral effect? And then maybe he looks at music and says, okay, you know, we might see this ennobling effect in music, but as you've said, it wears off. So when we're reading this and, and you've kind of made the point that, that Tolstoy in some ways is like giving you kind of uh, something to a, a, a narrator to be suspicious of, to draw you into that natural, like, all right, I don't know if I fully take this guy seriously. And Tolstoy invites you to not take this person seriously, to be critical of them. Um, if that by looking at the text, by almost alienating the author from it and giving you a sense that, okay, I feel like I and the author are having an indirect dialogue here by putting, looking at this text in both ways that make us both suspicious. And by being suspicious of what I'm reading here, I therefore un seem to understand the perspective of the author better because he's putting forth or he or she or putting forth this notion, you know, that I, I can be criti critical of here. Do you kind of, uh, that might be like a better way forward or like the idea that as uh, talking about the, the centralness of a creator in this process, that we might, th this challenge of how do you make a moral art if you take that seriously might then be found in trying to find ways that we are challenging ourselves and connect ourselves to that author there has to be a design here um is that like a way forward in, in understanding this or am i kind of am i off base in this in this reading i think so i mean i think if i understand um what you're saying correctly uh we sort of suspect Poznishev with Tolstoy. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And and I think that that is sort of a narrative structure that Tolstoy perhaps pioneers, or he's among the sort of earlier um, artists to use that. Nabokov uses this everywhere, right? That we're always sort of the reader and the author are always looking at each other behind the back of the unreliable narrator. Absolutely. But for Tolstoy, this ends up not being enough um, because uh there's still sort of room for interpretation and therefore room for misunderstanding. Uh, and so I think as we get into later and later works by, by Tolstoy, what he ends up doing is paring them down more and more, um, making them sort of more aesthetic. <laughs> uh, and so that there's no room for interpretation, there's no room for misunderstanding, um, that there's kind of more of a direct um, reading of the author's sort of intention um whether or not he's successful is a different question i right. think he remains an artist and so there remains you know always room for interpretation and misunderstanding and so forth it's a sort of um utopian ideal for tolstoy uh that we need not share um and that nabokov thinks is ultimately misguided that's why he doesn't pursue that he he too wants to foster a sort of sense of trust between reader and author um but he recognizes that that um, you know misunderstanding can never be completely eradicated, right? And interpretation, and in fact, if one does this, you know, one ceases to create art. Um, so he he continues along the lines of you know what's worked out in the Kreutzer Sonata, the narrative strategies worked out uh, in the Kreutzer Sonata. Yeah, we have a question from one of the people in our Discord server. So we have this whole server of people who love to just talk about Russian That's literature. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one of them, I understand this is not your area of expertise per se, but you might have something interesting to add here. Um, one of our Discord members was wondering whether Tolstoy's theory of art had any influence on the development of socialist realism. They said that they personally found this concept of the good you could replace with the party, and they sort of seem identical. So I was kind of wondering as we're steering towards um, right an art that leaves less room for misunderstanding, if you see any sort of impact on that sort of future development. Yeah, it's a great question. It's actually the subject of my next book, sort of how the Bolsheviks um, used and abused Tolstoy. Uh, <laughs> okay, well then I rescind it. You are an expert, <laughs> and I would love to hear what you have to say. I'm becoming an expert on that, maybe. Uh, not quite an expert, but anyway, I'm exploring that. It's a really mm. interesting question. Um, so Lenin writes many essays on Tolstoy and kind of the crucial essay is Tolstoy as the mirror of the Russian revolution, 
where he articulates sort of the what becomes the correct attitude toward Tolstoy's works, which is that Tolstoy uh, diagnosed correctly the disease of the imperial order. Uh, in other words, he was a good critic of the imperial order, right? All of its corruptions um, and so forth, but that he didn't recognize the need for a revolutionary cure. So for Tolstoy, uh, revolution has to start with personal transformation. And we see this in the Kreutzer Sonata as well, right? Uh, Poznyshev has this post-murder revelation, right? He recognizes uh, that what we take to be love is actually lust and sort of this recognition um, always has to be the germ of social transformation with these kinds of recognitions um, for Tolstoy. Of course, the Bolsheviks wanted systemic change, right? They, did, they didn't want uh, Tolstoyans roaming the countryside and so forth being personally <laughs> transformed. So they actually had a lot of work to do uh, to, um, to adopt the social critique in Tolstoy while rejecting what Gagnon called the landlord obsessed with Christ. Right. Um, so uh, neutralizing the sort of pacifist elements of Tolstoy, the Christian elements of Tolstoy and so forth. And that's not so easy to do because, for example, uh, Tolstoy's notion of good art is that it's a Christian art, um, not in the sense of sort of Christian doctrines, but in the sense of, you know, uh, loving thy neighbor and so forth. Right. A kind of pacifism is implicit there. Um so the Bolsheviks, it wasn't straightforward, um, this uh, adoption of Tolstoy. And in fact, in 1928, this was the centenary of Tolstoy's birth, the Bolsheviks felt compelled to kind of celebrate his birth, uh, but it was difficult for them to stage the celebrations um, because of, you know, Tolstoy's pacifism, his Christianity, um, and all of these elements that they didn't, you know, necessarily want to promote. Um, so it's a really rich, um, rich question, rich sort of topic, I think. I want to read that. And so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it, it sounds very interesting. Yeah, it does. I would love to get more into that. That's a fascinating topic. I love learning more about the ways the Soviets just like morphed things. <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> and it has, you know, re resonance today. So the, mm -hmm. mm, the book will actually be a kind of comparative study of the way that the Bolsheviks and the white emigres um, read Tolstoy after the revolution and, and used him for their various sort of ideological and political purposes. Um, and you see now the sort of difficulty of the current Russian regime, mm. uh, their struggle with incorporating Tolstoy uh, into their nationalist rhetoric for the same reasons, right? That the Bolsheviks struggled, the very sort of different ideologically, but that the Bolsheviks struggled with his pacifism, uh, his Christianity and so forth. Yeah. Difficult to invoke Tolstoy while waging war. Yeah, you both. <laughs> yes, exactly. You both feel like you have to talk about Tolstoy. He's just too big to ignore. Uh, but he's very hard to talk about when you're waging war. Absolutely. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, do you mind if I take it back? I want to talk about the the afterward. This is something, an interesting complication where, you know, we've, we've mentioned the, in some ways, if we, we in our reading here, uh, we're talking a lot about Poznashev's egoism and the ways that we can't really take Poznashev seriously. So we suggest that maybe we're, we're not, you know, all, all this extended argumentation about society and doctors and all that. Not, you're not supposed to take that literally seriously, but a slight complication there is the afterword to the piece, as you mentioned, where uh, Tolstoy, you know, doesn't, you know, goes to say some things like, of course, we can't have completely like, you know, there can't be complete chastity. Otherwise, there'd be no human race, like Poznashev kind of talks about a little bit. He also endorses a lot of, Poznashev's beliefs in a way. So that's an interesting and complicating factor in understanding the story. Yes. Yeah, so the afterword is written um, soon after the story begins to circulate and before it's uh, published uh, officially. Because Tolstoy receives many letters from readers asking for clarification uh, about these views that Poznashev espouses on chastity. So Poznashev's views are basically that ideally people would be entirely chaste uh, and then through sort of this chastity, their relations between people would not be sexual relations. They would not be relations of, you know, using one person for the pleasures of, of for one's own pleasures and so forth. Um, but that they would enact a sort of brotherhood of man, of mankind. Mm -hmm. So people wrote to Tolstoy saying, how is this possible, right? Isn't it natural for people to, <laughs> to have sex and to procreate? Uh, and, mm. you know, aren't you, aren't you participating in that kind of endeavor as well? Um, <laughs> and so Tolstoy uh, says that this 
the chastity is an ideal that uh, it's not that it should remain a sort of ideal, even if it's not realized in one's lifetime. And that sort of every generation that is born um, due to the failure of people to live up to that ideal has another chance um, to live up to that ideal. Right. Um, and so people read that as an endorsement of Poznyshev's post murder revelation, right? Which is that what we take to be love is actually sexual lust and it's inherently violent. But Poznyshev presents that revelation in a sort of formalistic way. He presents it as, you know, a doctrine to be followed. And that's not what Tolstoy is suggesting, that it's not a doctrine, it's an ideal. Um, so Poznyshev, in a sense, he is different after the murder. He's converted in some way, um, but he's still clinging to conventions. He still needs rules rather than an ideal. And I think what Tolstoy is endorsing in the afterward is the ideal uh, rather than the rules, right? So Tolstoy rejects religion, um, the religion of rules, right? He rejects formal church rituals and so forth. Uh, what he uh, adopts and uh, proselytizes are sort of Jesus's teachings uh, and the ideal, right, of Jesus's example. And so I think that distinguishes uh, kind of his own views from from the ones that we get uh, from Poznyshev in the story. So I have a question about categorization of Tolstoy's art. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times people throw around the term like extra literary in kind of a sort of vague sense of the word. I'm curious how you define that personally, especially when it comes to Tolstoy. Does it have to do with uh, possibility of misunderstanding the artist? Does it have to do with the form of, you know, the piece? Clearly, the Kreutzer Sonata is something that we would still consider literary, but, you know, why is that? And why do we get, towards the end of Tolstoy's life, how do we get to something that's extra literary, for instance? Do you mean something like his publicistic writing, his sort of explicitly yeah. moralizing yeah. tracts and so forth? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, how does how does it stay like, how does he take something that is, can be read on the surface as moralizing? And how does he keep it in the realm of literary? You know, what, what makes it literary? Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose the most basic answer is um, that as kind of a generic answer, right? What genre is he working in? So clearly this is a novella. He could have articulated these views and did right to some extent in um, an extra literary work like the um, afterward that he writes to the Kreutzer Sonata, but he doesn't. He filters them through um, through an unreliable narrator. Right? He he gives us a story that's a frame narrative. Um, I think what's interesting with Tolstoy is that he was never afraid to put his own views under question, uh, even the things that he would write sort of straightforwardly from his own person, right? The kind of didactic tracts. If you read his letters around it, he was never afraid to, to question some of his arguments, to reconsider them and so forth. Um, at this conference that I attended recently on Tolstoy and uh, Russian imperialism, someone presented a very interesting paper on um, Tolstoy's, uh, Tolstoy's views sort of against patriotism and nationalism, that he thought that these were always um, uh, pernicious, kind of sentiments. Uh, and he engaged in a lively debate with Polish nationalists who said, it's all well and good for you, you know, Russian, <laughs> uh, to condemn nationalism, but can't there be a sort of better, more human nationalism? And Tolstoy was very willing to think through this question and then sort of rearticulate his own opinions. Um, so, that kind of debate, you know, is obviously extra literary, uh, but still, I think, to his credit, infused with a certain searching that is so characteristic of Tolstoy. Uh, he can read um, like a, you know, dogmatic thinker sometimes, uh, but when you start to scratch the surface, I think that's almost never the case, right? I think that actually things are always more complicated, even in some of his um, sort of extra literary writings. Um, I feel like, I think we've covered a lot of their notes here, but before we wrap up, we always I like to have a little section at the end to just, are there any other thoughts that may don't net directly connect to what we've been talking about that we'd like to bring up before we start kind of transitioning out of the episode? No, I mean, I think we covered 
we covered a lot of ground. I, I hope I've sort of addressed the things that you were interested in, in reading the story. You know, it, it's hard when you write about something for such a long time, you have your own kind of take on it. Um, and I'm sure there are things that I don't notice or think about anymore. So if you, if there are things that you wanted to talk about more, I'm happy to, but yeah, I don't think I have anything. I had just one last thing. Okay. Yes. There's this really interesting scene to me uh, where Poznanshev is narrating this train ride that he takes and to me, for me, I don't know, I saw a lot of parallels between him and Anna. Um, this, there were a few that we talked about. There is, again, the reiteration of how bad it is to use morphine as birth control, essentially. Um, that's sort of like hinted at in both, if not directly stated. And then there is this almost mirrored scene between the two of them sitting on the rail car and he says, whether it was that having taken my seat in the carriage, I vividly imagine myself as having already arrived, or that railway traveling has such an exciting effect on people at any rate. From the moment I sat down in the train, I could no longer control my imagination. And with extraordinary vividness, which inflamed my jealousy, it painted incessantly, one after another, pictures of what had gone on in my absence, of how she had been false to me. And this reminds me exactly of the scene where Anna's sitting on the the train car and she's reading imagining herself as the as the heroine of the novels and she's she has to t like basically touch her face with the uh the knife that she's using to cut the pages to cool her down from her own imagination and there seems to be this link in the two between uh this like fast movement of the rail car and this like creative imagination between the two and i don't know it, it's not necessarily something that needs a lot of expounding on but like i personally found that to be a really interesting parallel and something I kind of like still chewing on, mm -hmm. seeing what I can make of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. Tolstoy associates the train with westernization, with modernization, all of these things that we take to be sort of, or that people took to be good things um, that in fact um, kind of get us further and further from a truth that we know intuitively or that the Russian people know intuitively. Um, and so he places the train in this set of things that derange the senses, right? Alcohol, tea, train travel, opium, they're all of a piece in that they derange the senses. We think that we're getting somewhere, but in fact, they sort of befuddle the mind. Um, and of course, his, his journey has two parts, right? One where he travels by cart, by carriage, uh, and he sort of delights in in the crisp air, right? And the the smell of the mud and the landscape that he um, views in a more natural way, right? It's slower travel. And then he contrasts it with the train, the second piece of his journey where uh, he's moving too fast. So things are moving by too fast and his imagination is kind of um, uh, stirred, right? It's moving fast as well in this way, um, turning, turning, yeah. I thought it, I thought it was interesting. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. I guess I'm not too Tolstoyan because I would love to travel more by train. <laughs> I don't think I don't think I don't think it makes me violent. But, uh, well, we know. experience the train very differently, right? I I, I I don't think I've ever maybe I've ridden in a, car in a carriage once or twice, but <laughs> um, but yeah, that contrast doesn't resonate so much anymore. Did it give you a a, a cool calm? sense of serenity yeah yeah <laughs> yep well, i wonder for people who are more used to a car-based society my, my experience having like taken the train to colorado or down to southern california it's always been a very common experience in relation to i mean in relation to traffic which i'm sure tolstoy never uh, that never had to address the right. ethical problem of uh of road rage uh from other people it's good you, he but... never had a car i don't think he would do well with road rage. <laughs> <laughs> he had a bicycle <laughs> so i think that's right. as far as he got <laughs> Um, cool. Well, before we wrap up, this is something we haven't really done this recently, but for a while we were uh, doing the signature called Zinger of the Week, which is just a favorite quotation or line uh, from a piece. And I wanted to extend that offer to you. Is there any like line that just kind of stands out for being interesting or funny or... How are you going to spring that on people, Cameron? Unbelievable. <laughs> In the story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um... This isn't actually in the story, but uh, it's a line I quote from Tolstoy's diaries. So for him, uh, egoism is tantamount to insanity. So he says, madness is egoism and conversely, egoism is madness. Um, so I, I like that uh, idea and sort of think about that a lot, right? That um, it's a close connection there. Um, and something that, you know, we might think about as we kind of ponder our own echo chambers, right? Um, 
Mm. in contemporary discourse. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thought. It's a good thought to, yeah, sit on for a little bit. Uh, Matt, I'm going to direct that same question at you, too. Uh, mine... Because I think I think I know what it is, and I think you're going to scoop mine, so I'm just going to let you do it. Um, mine, it, mine's not really a zinger, but it is probably my favorite line from the piece. I wanted to run after him, but remembered that it is ridiculous to run after one's wife's lovers in one's socks, and I did not wish to be ridiculous, but terrible. It's a great line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something, yeah. something to think about for our own lives, for sure. <laughs> yes, you always want to be wearing your shoes <laughs> when when doing something terrible. <laughs> a clearly applicable moral lesson. I, I know it does have like a real life kind of you know talking to someone. I'm sure we've all talked to someone who's got these characteristics of a Poznashev, of someone who like has these. I don't know. Maybe the, maybe I've just hung out with the wrong people in college, but they've got like this strong desire to leave this imprint on the world. And they're like, yes, I want to be terrible in some way. But from the outset, they look. I mean, they're running in they're running after, you know, their wife's lover in socks in a, in a metaphorical way. But um, yeah, that was, uh, I don't think there's too much to dig into there. Was that your line as well? Yes, that was, that was, uh, that was my line as well, just for uh, being the stand. Also, was good. just to add quickly, um, this is not a line, but an image that's, I think, so great. When he, when Poznashev has a fight with his wife and he's so angry and he picks up a paperweight and he thinks, I'm going to throw it at her. But I, I don't want to hit her. I just want to throw it close enough to scare her. And that strikes me as so human, right? In our in all of our relationships, which are hopefully not, you know, violent in this way. But you know, you always, when you're close with someone, want to just maybe throw that paperweight right near them to make them pay attention. <laughs> um, but not at them. Right. Uh it, <laughs> right. it's just I feel like that's a piece of kind of Tolstoyan psychology um, that is very, uh, that resonates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that is like interesting that Matt and I've talked about previously where we have characters for Tolstoy writes where our understanding is you're not necessarily supposed to take them. You're supposed to be kind of suspicious of them to, to use the language you've been using, but in a way Tolstoy is often so good at these like little human elements that people often can't help but empathize then, you know, uh, get away from Tolst far away from Tolstoy's intention and how they understand those characters. Absolutely, yeah. That's it's like when I see people on Twitter, or Instagram, like um, sympathizing with like Steva. <laughs> <laughs> He's very sympathetic. I love yeah, Steva. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else does too, right? Everyone in the book loves Steva. Yeah. Everyone loves Steva, except maybe his wife. I don't yes. Know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was so fun to talk to you, too. Thanks very much for doing this. I think it's great that you're kind of bringing a larger audience to some of these works that we love so much. Work? Yeah. No, and thank you for coming on. This has been really helpful for... We've been we've been talking around the Kreutzer Sonata for a long time, so thank you for coming on and providing a great perspective on, on reading this, because I think this would get away from our natural inclination to maybe, you know, read it as a Tolstoyan work, but also, like... All right, let's get a dig and dial in a little bit on what this guy says here. And I think this is a lot more productive than maybe what we'd have done alone. So thank you so much for coming on and providing a, uh, a much more informed uh, perspective on this, which has really been enlightening. I really enjoyed um, reading it, both it and especially within the context of your understanding, which was hugely useful in going into this reading. My pleasure. Thank you. To help keep our show independent and for exclusive access to notes containing all the research that went into this episode, head on over to our website, slaviclitpod.com. Before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current supporters who na whose names will be said here. <laughs> yes, and that's Mai, Daniel, Lou, Gary, Janice, and Isaac, Emily, Caitlin, Yitza, Irini, and Pack Rob. The music used in this episode was Staraya Kino by Peramotka. You can find more of this stuff on Bandcamp or Spotify. The links and spelling are in the show notes. 